The incursion and bombardment of Gaza is not about destroying Hamas. It is not about stopping rocket fire into Israel. It is not about achieving peace. The Israeli decision to rain death and destruction on Gaza, to use lethal weapons of the modern battlefield on a largely defenseless civilian population, is the final phase in the decades-long campaign to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. The assault on Gaza is about creating squalid, lawless, and impoverished ghettos in the West Bank and Gaza, where life for Palestinians will be barely sustainable. It is about building a series of ringed Palestinian enclaves where the Israeli military will have the ability to instantly shut off movement, food, medicine, and goods to perpetuate the misery. Privilege and power, especially military power, is a dangerous narcotic. Violence destroys those who bear the brunt of its force, but also those who try to use it to become gods. Ehud Barak, Israel's defense minister, said Israel is engaged in a war to the bitter end against Hamas in Gaza. A war? Israel uses sophisticated attack jets and naval vessels to bomb densely crowded refugee camps, schools, apartment blocks, mosques, and slums to attack a population that has no air force, no air defense, no navy, no heavy weapons, no artillery units, no mechanized armor, no command and control, no army, and calls it a war. It is not a war. It is murder. <laughs> the images of dead Palestinian children lined up as if asleep on the floor of the main hospital in Gaza are a metaphor for the future. Israel will from now on speak to the Palestinians in the language of death, and the language of death is all the Palestinians will be permitted to speak back. The use of terror and hunger to break a hostile population is one of the oldest forms of warfare. I watched the Bosnian Serbs employ the same tactic when I was in Sarajevo. And I also watched the Bosnian Serbs, like the Israelis, attempt to justify their systematic destruction of the city with thousands of dead and wounded on a few paltry Muslim mortars and light arms fire. Those who orchestrate such sieges do not grasp the terrible rage born of long humiliation, indiscriminate violence, and abuse. A father or a mother whose child dies because of a lack of vaccines or proper medical care does not forget. A boy whose ill grandmother dies while being detained at an Israeli checkpoint does not forget. Families who carry the broken bodies of their children to hospitals do not forget. All who endure humiliation, abuse, and the murder of those they love do not forget. This rage becomes a virus within those who eventually stumble out into the daylight. Is it any wonder that 71% of children interviewed at a school in Gaza recently said they wanted to be a martyr? Militant movements feed off of martyrs, and Israel is delivering the maimed and the dead by the truckload. Hamas fighters armed with little more than light weapons, a few rockets, small mortars, are battling one of the most sophisticated military machines on the planet. And the determined resistance by these doomed fighters exposes throughout the Arab world the gutlessness of dictators like Egypt's Hosni Mubarak.
who refuses to open Egypt's common border with Gaza despite the slaughter. Israel, when it bombed Lebanon two years ago, sought to destroy Hezbollah. By the time it withdrew, humiliated, it had swelled Hezbollah's power base and handed it heroic status throughout the Arab world. And Israel is doing the same for groups like Hamas. The refusal by our political leaders, from Barack Obama to all but five members of Congress, to the major media, to speak out in defense of the rule of law and fundamental human rights, exposes our cowardice and our hypocrisy. Those who openly condemn the Israeli crimes, including Israelis such as Yuri Avneri, Tom Segov, Ilan Pape, Gideon Levy, Amira Haas, as well as American stalwarts, Noam Chomsky, Dennis Kucinich, Norman Finkelstein, and Richard Falk, are ignored or spurned like lepers. They are denied a platform in the press. They are rendered nearly voiceless. Falk, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and a former professor of international law at Princeton, was refused entry into Israel in December, detained for 20 hours, and deported. Never mind that nearly all of these voices are Jewish. Falk labeled the assault before Israel made its incursion into Gaza uh, against the Palestinians as a crime against humanity. He reminded us that under international law, collective punishment of the Palestinians in Gaza is a flagrant and massive violation of international humanitarian law as laid down in Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The public debate about the Gaza attack engages in the absurd pretense that it is Israel, not the Palestinians, whose security and dignity is being threatened. This blind defense of Israel, Israeli brutality towards the Palestinians is a betrayal of the memory of all those killed in other genocides in other times. From the Holocaust to Cambodia to Rwanda to Bosnia, the lesson of the Holocaust is not that Jews are special. It is not that Jews are unique. It is not that Jews are eternal victims. The lesson of the Holocaust is that when you have the capacity to halt genocide and you do not, no matter who carries out that genocide or who it is directed against, you are culpable. And we are very culpable, the F-16 fighter jets, the Apache attack helicopters, the 250-pound smart GBU-39 bombs are all part of the $3 billion military aid we give to Israel. Palestinians are being killed tonight with American-made weapons. But perhaps our callous indifference to human suffering is to be expected we, after all, kill women and children on an even vaster scale in Iraq and Afghanistan. There will be more Palestinian children who die. There will be more UN schools used as a sanctuary by terrified families, blown to bits by Israeli bombs, with more than 40 killed half of whom were women and children. There will be more emaciated, orphaned children. There will be more screaming or comatose wounded in the corridors of Gaza's glutted hospital corridors. And there will be more Israeli lies. For that is what governments do in war. They distort and manipulate the facts, knowing that propaganda is a vital instrument in wartime. The shelling of the UN school in Jabalia 
took place, Israel said, because Hamas fighters had been firing mortars from near the school entrance. And they offered proof, an aerial photo which showed the school and the mortar. But the photo it was uncovered was more than a year old. It was a lie. And lies permeate the absurd reports like the one on the front page of this Sunday's New York Times titled, A Gaza War Full of Traps and Trickery. In this story, unnamed Israeli intelligence officials gave us a spin on the war worthy of the White House fabrications made on the eve of the Iraq War. We learned about the perfidious and dirty tricks of Palestinian resistance fighters. Foreign reporters barred from Gaza and unable to check the veracity of the Israeli version of the war are asked to abandon their trade as reporters to become stenographers. The cynicism of conveying Israeli propaganda and lies as truth as long as it is sourced to unidentified Israeli officials is the poison of American journalism. If this is all journalism has become, if moral outrage, the courage to defy the powerful, the commitment to tell the truth and to give a voice to those who without us would have no voice, no longer matters, then our journalism schools should devote their energies to teaching shorthand. It seems to be the skill most ardently coveted by the majority of our senior editors and news producers. Edward Said wrote about what he termed the fawning elasticity with regard to one's own side that has disfigured the history of intellectuals since time immemorial. And this disfigured history saturates our airwaves our universities, and our newsprint. There have always been powerful Israeli leaders since the inception of the State of Israel in 1948 who have called for the physical removal, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Indeed, 800,000 Palestinians were driven out by Jewish militias in 1948. But there were also a few Israeli leaders, including the assassinated Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who argued that Israel could not pick itself up and move to another geographical spot on the globe. Israel, Rabin believed, would have to make peace with the Palestinians and its Arab neighbors to survive. Rabin's vision of two states, however, died with him. The embrace of wholesale ethnic cleansing by the Israeli leadership and military is now unquestioned. This cleansing, for this is the intent of the campaign in Gaza, means Palestinians' right to exist was effectively canceled 61 years ago with the establishment of the Israeli state. It means an acceleration of the expulsion and extinction of the indigenous people whose land was stolen from them and whose land is now disappearing again under the weight of expanded settlements in the West Bank and newly seized territory by the Israeli military. It means that the infamous Plan D of 1947 and 1948, which resulted in the murderous depopulation of 369 Palestinian towns and villages by the Haganah, and the massacre upon massacre of Palestinian civilians in raised villages from Deir Yassin to Ramli to Lida finds its logical conclusion in the events in Gaza. It seems, wrote the Israeli historian Ilan Pape, that even the most horrendous crimes, such as the genocide in Gaza, are treated as desperate events unconnected to anything that happened in the past and not associated with any ideology or system. Very much as the apartheid ideology explained the oppressive policies of the South African government, this ideology, in its most consensual and simplistic variety, has allowed all Israeli governments in the past and the present 
to dehumanize the Palestinians wherever they are and strive to destroy them. The means altered from period to period, from location to location, as did the narrative covering up these atrocities. But there is, in his words, a clear pattern of genocide. Gaza tonight has descended into chaos. Hamas, which despite Israeli propaganda has never mustered the sustained resistance Hezbollah carried out during the Israeli incursion into southern Lebanon, has been crippled, if not broken. Gaza will be ruled in the future by antagonistic bands of warlords, clans, and mafias, resembling, I suspect, Somalia. And out of that power vacuum will rise a new generation of angry jihadists, many of whom may spurn Hamas for more radical organizations. Al-Qaeda, which has been working to gain a foothold in Gaza, may now have found its opening. Israel operates under the illusion that it can crush Hamas and install a quisling Palestinian government in Gaza and the West Bank. This puppet government will be led, Israel believes, by the discredited Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas, now cowering in the West Bank after being driven out of Gaza. Abbas, like most of the corrupt Fatah leadership, is a detested figure. He is dismissed as the Marshal Pétain of the Palestinian people, or perhaps the Hamid Karzai or the Nuri al-Maliki. He is as loathed as he is powerless. Israel's destruction of Hamas and reoccupation of Gaza will not bring peace or security to Israel. It will merely obliterate the only internal organization with enough stature and authority in Gaza, an organization elected to power in free and fair elections, to maintain order. The Israeli attack empowers the Islamic movements across the region, who one day may well ring Israel like a vice. The attack reduces all communication between the Palestinians and the Israelis to the language of force. The violence unleashed on Palestinian children will one day be the violence unleashed on Israeli children. This is the tragedy of Gaza, and this is the tragedy of Israel. Forty-plus years after W.H. Auden described the dumb org loose on the streets of Prague, he lopes, still dumb, through the alleyways of Gaza City. The org does what orgs can, deeds quite impossible for man. But one prize is beyond his reach. The org cannot master speech. About a subjected plane, among its desperate and slain, the org stalks with hands on hips while drivel gushes from his lips. Thank you.